Woof woof and namaste. This is Hill Dog welcoming you to Kanha Cast, a series of conversations from Kanha Shantivana, the International Center of Heartfulness in Telangana, India. Today I am talking to painter and sculptor Kathleen Scarborough. Kathleen has been an artist for over 5 decades now with a particularly keen interest in public art. Her paintings display a great sense of color and interdimensionality. She has been working on a series of paintings on India since 1995. Kathleen is also a heartfulness meditation practitioner. For those of you who don't know, heartfulness is a worldwide movement providing free meditation training to everyone. Since there will be a lot of reference to heartfulness in this talk, let me just fill you in on the heartfulness guides. The first guide was Lala ji, then there was Babu ji, from 1983 to 2014 Chari ji was the heartfulness guide and uh, from 2014 to the present day Daji has been the heartfulness guide. Sister Kathleen, your work has been something that uh, especially everyone in heartfulness is very familiar with because uh, there've been uh, there've been uh, paintings of Babuji, there've been paintings at the Omega School, there've been paintings we've seen your paintings so so many places mm. all around. So, was there a point growing up uh, when you decided that you were interested in art? Well, my father was a pianist. and my mother was a gardening nut and so the the love of beauty of different kinds i was kind of born into and when i told my parents i guess i was about 18 when i said i'm going to university now and i'm going to major in art and their first reaction was not particularly positive <laughs> but then um they were too difficult to bring around and after all my father was a piano player. He knew what it was like to do what you want to do in life. So he I think he just figured I did what I wanted to do. She can do what she wants to do. And then he said, "Well, you'll go into commercial art." That was the financial end of it. I said, mm -hmm. "Oh, sure, dad." I don't know you know what the term commercial art means at this point, but it's true that I did earn my living with my paintbrush as soon as I got out of art school. Well, wow. but I earned my living with my paintbrush doing public art. So my first years in Paris where I finished school in Paris were uh, 14 years of theater set decor. Then we started with my best friend in the United States an association to paint murals in public places in the Chicago area. And at first we were decorative painters, we worked for architects and interior designers and then we moved into real public art which is working for cities. M mainly one city where I did I don't I lost count of the number of murals. And then later we spread out into bronze casting and uh, sculpture. So basically I uh, used my skills as an artist to earn my living and paid into a pension fund and now I'm retired but nobody really knows what that means for an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so I just continue. But yeah, it was it was very interesting to work with populations which led me to what I did on the India theme. There's a definite a uh, link between the public art which at first I thought was kind of a fluke. Mm -hmm. I thought uh well that's interesting that I'm getting these job offers and I did it but I thought but then my private work that's something else. Well it took a few years before the whole thing became one thing and I understood that what I had been doing was really what I was supposed to be doing and it was not just to earn money or as an addition to um my private work which be somehow more um artistic or more important uh it took a while to work out that contradiction but actually it happened after i started meditating mhm mm when i started meditating i remember uh, before i worked on the india theme i would go to reunion island and work there that lasted 10 years and one day i just woke up in reunion island and everything had crystallized And that's what I think is so interesting about a meditative approach to life. Because we tend to overthink in the western world. We have strategy, we have plans, we think it all out. But in meditation, 
it's the experience first, the analysis afterwards, <laughs> and you do realize once you're in line with who and what you are, the opportunities will present themselves. Mm -hmm. It takes real faith to believe in that, and I certainly didn't believe in it for many, many, many years. I thought I had to make things work. Mm. It was much later that I realized that when you meditate, you become who you really are. You will meet who you need to meet, and you will do what you need to do, and you will be part of a society that has use for your skills. Because for me, it was very important to be part of society, to have a role in society as an artist. I had no desire, although I enjoy my studio, to do only that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to respond to our world and to be useful to a population. So I did a lot of work on populations. In other words, my first mural was for the Mexican community in Chicago. After that, it would be communities communities who would come to me and say, well, we want you to develop this theme or that theme, which I would do. Then there was the Reunion Island period, the 10 years where I painted daily life in Reunion Island. And of course, that led to India. Yes. And the India period, I think, is uh, until I leave this dimension. <laughs> this has been going on for 30 years, and I'm still totally inspired. So it's the most lasting engagement, huh? Yes. Well, it's it's such a beautiful theme you know I the the India theme is interesting from many points of view first of all the women wear saris a lot of the time now for a classical painter that I am drapery is so important sure and if you look at the Renaissance what did drapery mean why is there so much drapery in these Renaissance paintings and to me it is a sign of a spiritual element entering into the universe Generally, there's wind blowing and the drapery is flowing and it, it adds poetry. And so when I came here, you know, you do realize if you paint murals in the U.S., most of the people are wearing jeans and T-shirts. Much less inspiring than a lady with a sari, right? The sari is a bit like a canvas too, you know. It can yeah. be many colors, it can be any print, oh, it yeah. can be anything. Yeah. And the way the light lands on it and mm -hmm. the women. I've painted a lot of working women. Um, in, I have a, a name for them. I call them worker princesses because <laughs> I would see them on these job sites and you can't help but compare with your own job site. When I'm on scaffolding, I don't look like these ladies do. <laughs> I've got paint from head to foot. I've got on my old overalls. Well, here they are on these job sites with their salary, with their jewelry. It's fabulous to see and the, the way they stand so straight. It was just so inspiring. Wow. So, I painted a lot of in, of the Indian women of modest condition who never forgot that they were women. Wow. Somehow the femininity always remained there. To me, they were symbols of the eternal feminine. That's a beautiful way to put it, actually. So where did you grow up, Sister Kathleen? You were telling us I about... I was born in Chicago. In Chicago. And when I was eight years old, my parents moved to a town called Joliet, Illinois. Mm-hmm whose only claim to fame, as far as I can tell, is the prison. But the Blues Brothers movie started in Joliet, oh. in our prison. <laughs> so, so everybody knows about Joliet if they've seen the Blues Brothers. But, so then the next few years of my life were there. They were not particularly pleasant years. First of all, I think my theory is that if you were happy in high school, you have no talent. <laughs> Most of the people I knew were miserable in high school. Their lives became interesting once they went to college. That mm -hmm. was my case, too. So once I got out of the high school system where I was particularly inadapted to the American, uh, the American mentality, I couldn't seem to get excited about sports. That apparently was a serious defect in my nature, and I was <laughs> criticized for it. Yeah, because really... it's a very physical-oriented... Uh, oh, uh... sports in America is a religion. Absolutely. Know, Football, years... baseball. Yeah. And somehow I just couldn't develop any enthusiasm, and this was considered a serious character defect. I was criticized any number of times. Yeah, I think we're just one month uh, down the line from the Super Bowl, and everything was about the Super Bowl. It's a fever. <laughs> it's a fever. <laughs> so the fact that I didn't really care which way the ball went on the field or who was winning or losing, that was not in my favor. The fact that on my spare time I would read Shakespeare was somewhat incomprehensible. 
So I really became much happier in the college environment. What was the cultural context at that time, actually? You mentioned your father was a pianist. So uh, was he a classical pianist? or with the j- Because my the jazz father, scene was um, pretty... My father actually had stopped playing professionally when his children were born. Mm-hmm. But that music was still very much a part of our lives. And he would play every night, and we would sing and dance around. And, and I thought all families sang and danced around every evening after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I realized this wasn't really the case. He was, like Mary, many American uh, musicians, both a classicist and a jazz musician. He actually put himself through school by accompanying singers in, wow. in jazz, um, uh, jazz clubs. And he went on um, tour with a big band. My father was 45 when I was born, so he was t- touring with big bands long before I came into the world. So his big time, his musical repertoire came from the 1930s and 40s. And so that was the music we listened to in our home. You know, old Duke Ellington things and... Wow. Yeah. Wow. But it's it's a tough gig being a musician, usually. The way it's portrayed in popular culture as well, it's tough to, uh, you know... Uh, That's why he quit when we were when we were born when he married and we were born, but I thought there was one thing that I inherited from him which was rather humorous is that my father was one of the leaders of the Chicago Musicians Union, and their position was musicians should be paid for what they do, mm-hmm. and he would tell me they're their own worst enemy. They keep playing for weddings and I don't know what, and and they're not charging money and it's devaluing the profession. And, of course, later when I came along with my artwork, I wasn't in a union, but I sincerely believe that art is a necessary part of our society, that the, that the human society needs it, that it would be terribly impoverished if it disappears, and that artists should be technically proficient and use their skills to describe our human condition in such a way that we can make social change. Mm-hmm. Now, I have done any number of projects on that theme in the Chicago area. The last one was during lockdown. I was contacted by the Mother Jones Heritage Project in Chicago. Um, Not many people talk about Mother Jones these days, but she was extremely famous in her time. And she is in a great part responsible for the comfort that we enjoy today. Mother Jones spent her entire militant period of her life trying to fight for human rights, for human conditions in the workplace, getting children out of mines, because at that time, 1920, 1930, Mm -hmm. five-year-olds worked in the mines. Four-year-olds, they never got to play, they never saw the light of day. Mother Jones was from Ireland, she was born in Ireland, her family escaped from Ireland because of the potato famine. Then she came to the United States, she was a dressmaker, She had a husband and four children. They all died the same week of a pandemic. I don't remember if it was yellow fever or what it was, but they all died within a week. And she said, you couldn't even go and cry on your neighbor's shoulder because they had lost everyone too. Because now she's lived through two miserable times. Her sewing workshop burnt down in the Great Chicago Fire. That's number three. She became a famous militant after the age of 60. That's when she gave herself the name Mother Jones. She even exaggerated her age so that she could pass for more of a grandmotherly type figure. And she was fearless. They called her the most dangerous woman in America. She would yell at the president. She would yell at Rockefeller. She didn't care. If she thought people's rights were not being respected and they were having to live a miserable life because of greed, she would say so. And it worked. It worked. She actually did, of course, every, things are done by gr- large groups of people, but she inspired people. I have often been requested to do projects on this type of person. I did a, a bronze sculpture of Abraham Lincoln for the state of Illinois. Similar, similar situation. Trying to put an end to conflict between the North and the South. An inspiring figure a really inspiring figure. So dedicating myself to public art meant that I have always felt that I am on subject and Mm. that art 
matters to people. It matters to populations. And now I'm working in Paris to bring art into the workplace, mm -hmm. into offices. There's a wonderful law in France that allows companies to buy art and do a tax write-off over a five-year period. In other words, over a five-year period, they've paid for the painting, and now it's theirs. Wow. And they, and they can completely deduct that from their taxes. The law has been renewed for the next three years. So I'm going to companies saying, okay, people need to live. You, you shouldn't be in these offices with concrete walls and, and computers. Is that your universe? So we started by having an exhibit in the Bread Bank in Paris. We filled the entire bank with paintings. Had a wonderful opening night. It was, the people in the bank were ecstatic because they don't want to live in a cold, inhuman universe. And if you look at the Renaissance, all of the art of Florence and Rome, this was done by a small number of people over a short period of time, but it made the places totally magical. So that's my point of view. We can make our universe more humane, more delicate, more beautiful, and it will transform humanity. Because if you grow up in a beautiful environment, like here in Kanda with the vegetation and the, the general elegance of the place, it's not the same as growing up in a place where there's nothing but dust and pollution and rattle trap buildings, so. which I know well because I grew up for part of my life in that type of environment. It makes you feel so different to be surrounded by beauty and meaning, feeling that you belong to a society, that you can contribute and that humans have a natural beauty and dignity. So that's what my art is about. Wow. So you mentioned you uh, immediately knew in college that you were majoring in art. Mm -hmm. You told your parents that. Mm. Uh, what had your previous sort of exposure to art been? Uh, of course, the music sessions and dancing after the day's work yeah, was done. Yeah. But was there also drawing and... Uh, my parents were very nice people. They had no particular feelings about drawing or painting, but when I asked for drawing classes, they gave them to me. And when wow. I asked for dance classes, they gave them to me. They really believed in the arts in general. And so the reason that I chose a, an art that you can do alone is that I found the other forms of art were difficult to have a normal life with. So you become a musician. You're traveling around. And you're dependent on other family. People. Some days you feel well, some days you don't. Sure. Dancers, same thing. But art, you know, basically you work alone, and then one day you, you open the doors and you take the work out, or you finish the mural and you celebrate it. But most of the time you're just working, and you can work other elements into your life that we all like to have, like family relationships and things like that. So that was pretty much the choice. And... Um, I met my art teacher when I was only 19. I went to Southern Illinois University, and there I met a man who could paint so beautifully. I mean, I, it was just overwhelming when I saw his paintings, and I knew that this man could help me. He became my teacher. He stayed my teacher until he died when he was 85, and I took his students after that. So our friendship lasted our whole life. and. Uh, and that's been another theme in my life, is that when I needed a master, I always found one. Hmm. He just was there. Wow. And he actually lived in France, and later he moved back to France, and we ran into each other on the street. We had lost contact with each other and ran into each other on the street in Paris. So there was that meeting. There was my father, who was in a way a master in the sense that it didn't ever occur to my father not to do what he wanted to do with his life. He just always did what he wanted to do, for better or for worse, <laughs> like all of us, right? Sometimes yes. real bloopers, but hey, he wanted to do it, he A did and it. And your mother stood by him in this? Uh, he has a strong character. <laughs> 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 she never criticized him for anything like that. She followed and tried to help. <laughs> and then I met Chari, Chari G. And, but that, I would say, was the master that surprised me in the sense that I didn't expect that. I mm. really didn't expect. Uh, one day in Paris, a friend says, oh, there's a, you know, uh, a group meditation that's open to the public. Well, you know, in heartfulness, we don't often, at the time, it was Sahaj Mar, they didn't really do that. 
when I've yeah, I, I remember people used to be asked to leave who yeah. weren't yeah. Uh, weren't part of the. So I had already figured out that if I had a problem in my life, it was an uncontrolled mental situation when I couldn't always overcome the r- noise in my brain of impertinent thoughts that shouldn't have been there. So that much I had figured out. But, of course, I didn't know how to do anything about it because I would try to stop it, and it would just start up. And, and so just as I had come to that conclusion that really there must be some way to do this, that's when this happened. Wow. So I walked, and, and, and it was, once again, the way things happen in a meditative path. No decision, no strategy. I walk into a room, and my thoughts stopped. And suddenly I felt like I was home. It felt like such a warm, beautiful place. And it was only because Chariji was sitting there. And then total confusion ensued in my mind because I couldn't understand, I still don't understand, (laughs) how a person can change your world without speaking to you, without looking at you, without knowing who you are. This was totally out of my definition of what can happen to people in life. And so it was confusing, exciting. Uh, it, it took me a few years to realize that there wasn't any point in trying to understand, that some things can't be understood, and that the mental tool is totally inadapted to understanding, just the way you can't understand love is not meant to be understood. It's meant to be lived. So once I finally got over that hurdle of saying, well, I'm trying, what is, what is this? What, how does this work? Why, why did this happen? Then I finally just said, well, maybe that's not the way this needs to be lived. And then, then I just continued uh, the path, and I'm still here today, and <laughs> we'll be here for the duration. So what year was that uh, when you first met Chariji? 1988. 1988. And it was on July 4, which I thought was symbolic. It was American <laughs> Independence yes, Day. Yes, sure. <laughs> so you had, uh, you had spiritual fireworks instead. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. Yeah. Wow. But I believe, honestly, that everybody who comes into a meditative path has a, an appointment with destiny. Mm-hmm. And that appointment will be orchestrated according to who and what you are and what you need and what corresponds to your personality. I needed something spectacular because I don't think anything subtle would have worked. (laughs) (laughs) So I got something spectacular. (laughs) So did you know it immediately? You mentioned that uh, you walked in and your thoughts stopped that one session. So because uh, uh, there are some people who feel it immediately, and for some people it's a gradual process that the relationship builds. Mm. What was it like for you? Instantaneous. Wow. Not only did the thoughts stop, but this surge of love in my heart that just came up and was pouring out. And I had never experienced anything like that. But my, the most interesting part of it was that it was familiar to me. Wow. I, I thought, this is the real me. This is who I have always been. How could I be wandering in the desert all these years when this is what humans really are? So it was a gift. It was a fabulous gift to give to someone who'd never meditated in her life. <laughs> <laughs> well, we... And certainly didn't deserve such a beautiful gift. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a, something we'll come back to. I wanted to ask you, you shifted from the States to Paris to mm-hmm. study art. And what was that like? You mentioned that uh, growing up in uh, Joliet, Joliet, yeah. Joliet uh, Illinois, wasn't that great? No, no, it wasn't too great. But do you suddenly get to Paris? And this is university, right? You're doing it. Well, I went to university first in Joliet. That much was fun. Mm-hmm. It was a young university, and the teachers were young, and we all had a good time. But it was a two-year uh, institution. So then I went to Southern. That's where I met the painter who was so fabulous. Yes. And then after that, it was I wanted to continue studying. But, you know, graduate study in America is horribly expensive. And I knew that artists needed to live in a big city. So I thought, well, if I'm going to change, why not go to Paris? I had traveled a bit, been there twice, thought it was a great place. So I just went to Paris and asked to be admitted to art school, and they immediately accepted me. And so I finished my studies there. 
at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. <laughs> had you had you uh, lost touch with uh, the person who was mentoring you in the states, or you? Yeah, I'd lost touch with him by then. We we had uh, sometimes we would go ten years where after a spat when <laughs> about style or some silly thing, but um, when I was in Beaux Arts, he was not in the in the on my radar. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So what, what was culturally what was Paris like? Was it was it a big uh, difference from oh, the states? It was a huge difference. Um, you know, the French are an incredibly opinionated lot, and they <laughs> they think a lot about um, current subjects, you yeah, know, sure. politics. And it turns out that I married into a family of militant um, communists, and but also intellectuals, journalists, and history teachers. So this was quite an opening of the panorama for me. Of this so, so your marriage happened where? Uh, in Paris. In Paris. Yeah, I married a Frenchman. Mm -hmm. And this family, dinner with the family, they would bring up all of these important subjects, historical subjects, and debate them in the family. <laughs> so I, at first when I, well, first of all, I had to speak the language well enough to know what was going on. And then, uh, you know, then it became really exciting to hear all these different points of view about current mm -hmm. life. It's a, it's a change from the dancing and... Uh... Yes, my parents were not particularly interested in politics, global politics, or even local politics. They were just trying to live their lives and they were interested in spirituality though. Mm -hmm. My parents had a real passion for spirituality. And there's a church in the United States called the Unitarian Church. I was raised in that. And you enjoyed it? You enjoyed well, that? Well, what was interesting is they, it's not, in a way, it's not really a church to my mind because they didn't know what they believed. So to me, a church implies some belief, but the Unitarians was more of a theosophical society. They would oh, okay. tell us, you know, well, here's what the Buddhists think, and, and here's what the Hindus think, and, and here's what the Shintoists think. And, and so by the time I was 15, I knew there were many, many religions in the world and that people had all kinds of different beliefs. And my parents just had a real fascination for spirituality. So that was, I think that was a precursor to what happened later. And then uh, you get married into this family, which mm. is deeply uh, leftist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting dichotomy, to say the least. <laughs> yes. How did, your, how did uh, it influence your art, both the spirituality and the, the, then political? the political? I don't know, really, you know. You live all these experiences, and somehow it distills into a general point of view. Mm -hmm. But they, um, I would say what they had in common with my parents, my parents-in-law, is everybody thought I was trying the impossible to be an artist, and they told me as much. They <laughs> said, no artist can earn his living. And I thought, surely it must be humanly possible. <laughs> and uh, so I proved them wrong. I proved them wrong. But everybody, that, and even today, that's a current idea that if you go into art, you will suffer from poverty. There's now, the trope of the penniless artist and, you know. Yeah, but that's a recent thing. Yeah. I have actually given talks on who paid who to paint what at what time and why. Hmm. So the penniless artist was not around in the Renaissance. They needed their artists. He wasn't around during Egyptian times either. They needed their artists. The Greeks needed their artists. The Romans needed their artists. The Renaissance needed their artists. And, uh, you know, the Baroque, uh, this was all very much part of daily life. So this image of, oh, the artist who's penniless and usually a little schizophrenic mm. and alcoholic, yeah, yeah, too. Absolutely. Is Prone a, to cutting off their ear. Yeah, very <laughs> recent invention. Oh. And has nothing to do with the role in society of art. And it actually has caused great destruction. It has caused great destruction because during, you know, the... 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. You learned how to paint, and you better be good. When you see the paths that the artist followed, hmm. you're the apprentice. Then you're the journeyman. Sure. The journeyman is paid by the day. That's why they call it journée. You get paid by day. You're a, you're a painting hand. And the word masterpiece comes from you have created a piece that proves that you can open your own studio. 
your mm. masterpiece. And it will be judged. The Raft of the Medusa by Jericho is his masterpiece. I can paint sky. I can paint people. I can paint water. See, I did it. And now I can open my studio. And then there were places where you would show your work. There would the Prix de Rome, you could get sent to Rome. But everybody needed you. They needed you for portraits. They needed you for historical paintings. They needed you for allegorical paintings. All of these people earned their living. Now, they may have been more or less popular at different times. There actually was a time in Rome when both Leonardo and Michelangelo were out of work and Raphael got all the commissions. But they did okay. You know, they still did okay. There, there. You know, these trends and who's the latest guy. We, we're used to that now. You know, the things are more or less popular. But the real destruction of the role of art in society came with the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But it that doesn't have to be permanent. That's sure. what I'm trying to prove. <laughs> sure. And this trope that you mentioned is uh, recent. This trope of the penniless artist, the stereotype. Mm. Uh, it's destructive in that sense that a lot of parents would balk at their children choosing art as a career because of the stereotype. Well, plus, the, there's a problem with the art schools, mm -hmm. okay? First of all, they're not teaching technique the way they should. That's one problem. In order for me to be useful to someone, I have to be able to paint pretty much anything they want. Sure. Landscape, portrait, you name it, I should be able to do it. That's my job, okay? They're not really teaching that the way they should anymore. The other thing is, is they're not teaching people how to create an audience. What is an artist? An artist is someone who has something to say. Okay, what's your message? What's your message and who are you talking to? So in order for an artist to be successful, he has to have an audience who needs him, like me and the Mother Jones Heritage Foundation or the City of Joliet or the schools that needed artwork. I did plenty of murals on the importance of education in schools. Hmm. So if you get out of art school thinking it's just about sitting in your room and, you know, doing some kind of artwork that you and your friends like, that's not going to get you anywhere. And I criticize the current situation, not only from a technical point of view, but they're, they're not helping people to understand that art is about communication. And it's about audience. And if you have an audience and you are able to communicate for that audience, you are the one who's creating, in visual terms, the idea that they want communicated. Mm. Now, in commercial terms, everybody understands that. In advertising, you, you know, you've got to make people yes, exactly. want this thing. You know? exactly. yeah, yeah. But it could be the same thing with art within society. So that is not being taught. I had mm. to figure it out on my own. It kind of happened to me more than me figuring it out. Like I said, it's a meditative path, so it happened first, and I figured it out later. But that ability to know who you are, which means you cannot say, I don't need to know who I am to be an artist. You definitely need to know who you are because you have to find the like-minded souls who think that your message is vital. Mm -hmm. And you can also say, what are the vital messages of today and how can I help? To me, the ecological message is a hugely vital and important message. Sure, sure. And it should, artists could jump on that. They could do fine earning their living. But they are not taught to, to construct a portfolio, uh, even do the first uh, mural if you want free, just so they know what you're doing and you can start establishing an audience. You could very well... Just take that ball and run with it, and you would have clients. You would be able to earn your living. And it's not being taught. Mm -hmm. And so, it, of course, parents say, well, and, and I said, too, when I got out of, a uni uh, out of uh, art school in Paris, okay, I've got my diploma. Now what? What is this good for? How can I use this to be part of society? And to me, it was not negotiable. I was not going to do something else. Most of the artists just say, okay, well, I'll become a teacher, or I will just paint on weekends, or it'll be a hobby. Well, what's that going to do the quality of art in the world? Sure. The Renaissance painters were not hobbyists. <laughs> in order to get good, you have to paint every day, all day. Absolutely. So it would kill technical quality for people just to paint from time to time, just the way a musician has to practice every day. Well, an artist does too. So there is this um, clearly 
uh, you are uh, you mentioned that technique mm -hmm. and getting good at your technique mm -hmm. is extremely mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. But there's also this feeling that uh, art is all about being inspired. Do you think that's just fanciful ideas, being inspired and It's funny you ask that question because my father it. asked me the same question. Mm -hmm. He was a, a musician. I said, Daddy, <laughs> did you only play piano when you were inspired? Did you practice every day? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I practice every day. Well, I paint every day. You can't get good otherwise. Mm. And, you know, if it's a profession then you don't wait for some, you know, in inspiration to come. Now, the fact is I feel highly inspired. I don't need anybody to pay me to paint a picture. I love to do it. And once you get it going, in fact, in France, they call that the sacred fire. Once you get this thing going, it pulls you along. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry anymore about inspiration. The paintings seem to be like they're lined up and they're waiting to be born, and you're doing as fast as you can to get them to exist. Mm. And also this, uh, you mentioned the Renaissance painter. So I, I, you grew up admiring the works oh, of the yes. Renaissance. But there's also now, you come to the 20th century and there is uh, expressionism, abstraction. What was your response to that? Perhaps where, where so much emphasis is not placed on technique. Well, people can enjoy uh, lots of things, but if you want to earn your living, and you want to earn your living because you can do something like a plumber knows how to set up piping and uh, a typist knows how to type. Well, I know how to paint in terms, in professional terms. Mm -hmm. Now, you can do anything. I mean, people can enjoy all kinds of activities. Sure. But I think if you're looking at it from a f professional point of view and of communication with the largest number. If you really want to communicate to a large number of people, very few people really are interested in art for art's sake. But they can be sensitive to a message. I had an experience with one of the clients, if you want to call him a client, it was a school. I actually met an old high school friend and I had got a budget from the city to do a mural in her school. And she said, I don't care about murals. I want a sculpture. I said, well, you know, it's not the same budget. We don't have a sculpture budget, we have a mural budget. And then I said, what is important to you as a teacher? What matters to you? What are you trying to get through to students and their parents? And she said, oh, she went into a whole list of things. The importance of harmony and diversity, the importance of reading, the importance of joy, enjoying learning. I said, let's make that the subject of our mural. It hadn't occurred to her that we could do that. So when you use your tools to uphold ideals of other people, you have an audience, you have work, and you can get paid, and you can have the satisfaction of being part of society and defending things that are important for all of us. Mm. So, of course, meaning has meaning and message is very important to you in art. And um, in the early 1900s, 1920s, we saw a lot of muralists, the Mexican muralists, for example. who Fabulous. Had, Fabulous. Yeah, and full of meaning and full of um, messages. Uh, I was taught by one of Orozco's uh, students. Wow. Yeah. No, <laughs> wow. The, see, the thing is, my first mural was in Chicago for the Mexican community. And so Orozco, Siqueiros, and Rivera mm -hmm. were very important to us. And they inspired the entire Chicago mural movement in the 60s. And that movement, where did it come from? It came from artists being tired of being alone in their studios and wanting to be useful to society and to talk about important issues using their paintbrushes. That's where the Chicago mural movement came from. And that's what I was swept into in 1975. Mm -hmm. But then also... Uh, uh as art developed, we, we were introduced to the Jackson Pollocks and the mm -hmm. Mark Rothkos of mm -hmm. the world, which was a totally different direction. Mm -hmm. Was that art something you admired and cared for? I am very interested in exploration. Mm -hmm. You take someone like Picasso. Picasso was really good. Now, I think he became arrogant, and I think he... At the, there was a point where everyone told him that everything that he did was a genius, yeah. so he just stopped making an effort. Same thing happened to Salvador Dali. They become self-indulgent. 
fabulous man. I mean a fabulous painter. And he got lazy, too. When everybody tells you all day you're a genius and no one has a critical eye on your work, and if they do, you brush them aside because there's 2,000 people telling you how wonderful you are. True. You could fall into that weakness. But Picasso, I thought, was interesting because he redefined how to compose a picture. And I think we use those things that he discovered, even in figurative art all the time, because composition is extremely important, and that was his strong point. So he had something to give me, even though I had no desire to paint like Guernica or things like that. But there also then there's this whole um, whole group of curators and arts writers and everybody who kind of builds up the hype of things. Oh, yeah. Who will tell you that Dali never did anything wrong in his life and Pablo Picasso, every line he's put down on paper is pure gold. Yep. What, what, where do you think that comes from? Is it like... A, is it I think a, it's always been that way. And it's always been um, the emperor's new clothes. You know, you can all convince people of almost anything. But um, free thinking, well, it it comes back to meditation too, doesn't it? Mm. Believing that you can actually look at the world and have your own opinion. And you don't have to have the same opinion as everybody else. But the fact is that the art world, that art world, the galleries, the museums, how present is that in most people's lives? It's a really tiny audience. I preferred going for a real big audience of people and speaking for them on issues that were important to them. Absolutely. I mean, public art. Your, your mm. art is very visible. Your sculptures mm. are very visible. Yeah, everything's places. in the public arena. Mm. And uh, I think, well, for example, when I was in Chennai one time, I was talking to Chari Ji about the kids, and I said, I do hope they have all visited the museum with all those beautiful bronze sculptures. I found out that even the people living in Chennai, a lot of them had never taken their children there. So I chartered a bus, took 60 kids to the museum. They had a great time. They took their drawing tools. And their teacher was there to help me. They did drawing there. I had a show going in Chennai at the time. Then they went to the show, and then we brought them home, and they had a wonderful day. So. We need to be exposed to these things. You can't love something if you've never seen it and never known about it. So part of it also is letting people know that they have national treasures. I just returned to the Salar Jung Museum a week ago, and I thought, somebody needs to take care of this place. Yeah, it's... Uh... They have a fabulous collection, and it's dusty, and there's pieces missing, and there's, you know, I don't understand it. You know, when you have something that beautiful... There's something to be done with just people being aware of a treasure when they see it and preserving it. Mm. So true. Do you think that, uh, because a lot of kids, um, you know, will ask themselves this question, can I be an artist? And do you think a lot of people say, oh, anybody can be an artist? So do you think that's true if you work hard enough, just like if you work hard enough at any craft, you could learn that yes. craft. Well, that was the attitude before. Mm -hmm. During the Renaissance, you might have a Raphael. You might have a Titian. You might also have people who were good to do the background. And maybe that would be the maximum that they were capable of. There were lawsuits for Titian if the people that he had commissions from thought that he hadn't spent enough time on the work. Oh, so they weren't getting enough Titian for because their the, money. Yes, yes. Titian was supposed to be doing the faces and, and the big and the details. And, and if they thought that he had, because he had his whole family working for him. <laughs> so if they thought, you know, he hadn't spent enough time on their piece, he could, he could get a lawsuit over that. But that doesn't mean there's not room. It's like for musicians. You have the soloist, and then you have, uh, you know, the man who can pl play in the background, but is still very, very good. Art is actually much more logical than people realize. Most people can learn to draw. I would say if you have normal intelligence and you taught it in schools, everybody would know how to draw. It's totally logical. In fact, that disappoints people. I've, paint, I've showed a few people the basics of drawing. When they realized it was drudgery, they quit. <laughs> <laughs> they thought you enter into some kind of trance and things just happen. Well, not really. It's hard work. So if you are willing to do the hard work, or I'd say you can compare it to writing. You can learn to write well. Doesn't necessarily make you a Hemingway, but you can write well. And so I think everyone can learn that. Now, after that, it's how demanding are you of yourself? 
And how well do you know yourself? And were you able to establish an audience? Do you have a message? And if it is, you do have a message, what is it? And who are you trying to convey it to? Wow. So, Kathleen, we, you touched on how you started Heartfulness. You walked into that open sitting, which was an, an unusual thing in any case. How did it develop from there? How did, how did your life change with this? Uh... Well, I think meditation is a gradual process of becoming yourself. So it was a gradual process of letting go of things that I needed to let go of. I think all of us need to do that. Letting go of what, uh, the fact that people don't share your opinions, for example, that my opinions say about uh, modern art. Well, not everybody shares them. That's okay. They don't have to. I don't have to convince anybody. You can be yourself, but knowing who that is takes your whole life, you know? Yeah. And you spoke of your India engagement as well, about the India mm -hmm. painting. That is still an ongoing series. It's ongoing. It's an ongoing series. It's an ongoing. Series. So did that start after uh, you started meditation, or you had been to India before um, that as well? I was in Reunion Island. I was already meditating, and I was finishing up the Reunion Island theme. Now, the difference with Reunion Island is that the island is fairly small. Uh, how did that come about? How did you... I was a muralist. Mm -hmm. People knew I was a muralist. And mm -hmm. so they brought me in to do murals and to teach murals. And at the same time, I wanted just to paint the island because it was so beautiful. And I, I was really enjoying being there and getting to know the people. So I spent actually 10 years doing this thing of painting murals, come back in my studio, paint paintings about Reunion Island. Because when you're on a mural site, it's never as refined as what you can do in your studio. And you don't have much time to concentrate. You don't have much time to develop your style because there is urgency. You're only there for a certain amount of time and there's an awful lot to do. So I would come back and then say, then digest what I had lived and continue to develop the paintings. And after 10 years of that, I had a show in the Museum of Mankind in Paris filled up the entire ground floor. It was great. They did a nice catalog, posters, the whole thing. This is a national museum. And then I felt like I was at a moment when it was time to move on. Um, because the island was small, because they had their own painters, I was just taking up too much space. You know, they gave me their medals and they gave me these jobs. And, and I felt like they deserved, in such a small universe, to be the stars in their universe. And meanwhile, I had taken up meditation and I had started coming to India. And then, you know, the visual side of India is so exciting. You know, there's, uh, everything's painted, everything's decorative. The Indians have an incredible joy of color and decoration. So, and not only that, this incredible history of philosophy and meditation and uh, trying to understand what a human really is. I'm fascinated by that, and that will last, I think, as long as I'm alive. You know, it's, it's a really interesting subject. And so I read constantly. I'm re reading now um, a biography of Vivekananda and people who are so dedicated to trying to get to the basic, important things for a human. And that you find here. Mm. You really do find it in India, those great, great uh, minds that devoted their entire lives to trying to get to the bottom of this mystery. You know. And of course, your engagement with uh, meditation, Sahaj Marg, as it was called then, now heartfulness, it, uh, you all, it also brought you into contact with the, uh, the guide at that time, Chariji, mm -hmm. and you got to spend time with him and interact with him. Mm -hmm. Did you ever... Did he ever share his views on art with you, or did you have interactions about art? No, he just kind of naturally understood my position. Mm -hmm. You know, when I would laughingly say, all these painters are out there painting, but they don't know why, he knew what I was talking <laughs> about. He really understood me as a person. Um, but what I wanted to do, when the first painting that I did, which was the triple portrait of Babuji that many people have in their homes, there's a, an interesting story behind that one, because... Now I am in Sahaj Marg. Now I have decided this is my path. So I thought, well, 
I would like to come out of my anonymous position. Uh, why don't I do a painting for Chari G that I think he would really like, and that way he would know who I am. So I was looking kind of for a reward, and uh, which isn't the purest way to go about doing things. But anyway, that was the situation. So I started working on this painting. And it was a cold winter in Paris, and I was alone in my studio. It was so cold that I moved the easel into my bedroom, and all I did for six weeks was eat soup, paint, and look at Babaji's face with a magnifying glass. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And after about five weeks, I was awakened in the middle of the night with a vision, a complete vision of Babaji. He actually, I'm, I felt like I had almost an act of witchcraft. I had invoked the gods and the god came. It's only happened once in my life. He actually came to me. And I saw this door that was partially open and I peeped through the door and Babuji was sitting there. And I thought, I can't go in there. And he told me to come in. So I went in, and then there were three scenes. I was serving him some tea. Then we were sitting on the ground laughing like two little kids. And the third scene was a tall man was there with a blanket, and he wrapped me up with Babuji with the blanket. This was more real than you and me sitting here now. Wow. It was such a shock that I cried for hours afterwards. I couldn't assimilate that you can really, truly have the visitation of someone who has left this earth and who is a master. It happened to me. Well, that'll anchor you in a method, right? Also someone you'd never met. I never met him. So somehow that co intense concentration where I did nothing for six weeks but try and understand how his face was made, what it, expression, how I could, that, that proved so many things to me. Now, of course, you get the proof, and then later on it takes years for you to actually act on that. But to me, first of all, I knew no reward that would come after that would ever equal what had happened. Chari was, of course, charming and delighted with the painting. But I had had my reward. It's amazing, I was alone. I wasn't in a meditation center. This is how powerful we are. If we had enough faith, it would happen to all of us. It would be part of our daily lives. And when you read Vivekananda and what, and what it was like, what they say about Ramakrishna, they were so intent on knowing God, knowing the Master, nothing else would do, and it happened. And we all have that power. And to me, that was proof, living proof, that we all have this. So it was, to me, an education in faith. Faith should be there because it can be there. It's not an illusion. You're not making it up. It's true. You can have the experience of the divine yourself alone without being in any particular situation if the intensity of the experience that leads up to it takes you there. Well, but how do you, how, how does life change after an experience like that? Because, you know, suddenly your idea of reality is being challenged, it's like. It takes a long time to digest. Hmm. It takes a long time to, even with that, you have trouble believing it really happened. But like today, I can tell you exactly every image of that vision. And later I understood what it meant. It wasn't just to prove to me, that was of course the main thing was you can have faith. The divinity exists. It is available to you and to anyone who develops enough intense desire to have it, it will come to them because that's the way the world works. But the vision of him me serving him. Okay, so you're helping the master. It's something you need to do to contribute to those things that are important in this life. Second thing, you're in, sitting down and laughing. You're enjoying the master's presence. 
just the pure joy of being around. And the third thing, unity, being joined with the divinity. That was amazing how concise it was done, how it was made to, for an individual person. It's like I was saying, you have these rendezvous with destiny. It's made for you. Whatever path you take to get here, to get there, to get to the goal, those tools will be given to you. And they will be given to you according to who you are. So nobody's going to have the same experience. You know, each one will have his or her experience. But if the intensity is there, if the work is there, if the desire is there, it cannot not happen. It must happen. Wow, that, that, that would be such an intense experience that, you know, it would almost be a danger that nothing else would, normal life wouldn't be that great anymore because it would never live up to the intensity of that experience. It's like the grand moments in our lives, the day you become a mother, the day that something happens that will color your life from then on and will orient you and will let you know what really matters. So then you say, okay, I'm going to live out this life. I know that when I leave here, it'll be a different story. I'll do my best while I'm here. But it's okay. It's okay that I can't live in bliss every day, every minute. Maybe we're here to work. We're here to help each other. We're here to have goals and pursue them, help others pursue their goals. That's what this is about here. It's for everybody, whether they meditate or not. It's pretty clear that that's what's going on. So I think when we leave here, leave here we'll say, well, that happened in the blink of an eye. You know, I really think that. I think it'll be like waking up from a dream and saying, well, that was interesting. <laughs> now let's move on. <laughs> well, I think that that, that uh, brings me to your book, Nomad Souls, because that's also about, uh, you know, uh, the very title says about being here. And that's being. us. <laughs> <laughs> so how that's did this us. book come about, Kathleen? Well, I had finished uh, quite a few paintings about India. And... Um, you know, artists like to have a book with their work in it. And I thought, I don't want to do a monograph, you know, where she lived, who she married, uh, where she went to school. I don't, often when I buy a book, I don't read that part of it. I just look <laughs> at the pictures. So I thought, what can I do other than that? And I thought, why not put Indian poetry? Because Indian literature is totally um, underappreciated in the Western world. And... So it's, it's, there's two things. I'm trying to reunite two audiences, those who love literature and words and those who love the paintings. And sometimes it's the same person. Um, the idea it was to bring some greater awareness in the, Europe to um, the quality of Indian literature and its scope. So uh, it took me a while to find the poems that I wanted to put in. Luckily, I had two women who really helped me. One who was a teacher of um, medieval Indian poetry at the University of Paris. And the other, France Bhattacharya, was a, the official Tagore translator in France. And both of these women had incredible libraries and were happy to help me. So we, I would go to their homes and we would just read and read and read to find poems that corresponded to the themes developed in my paintings. Uh, at the end, there were a few themes I simply couldn't find anything on them. And then I requested living poets to write about them, which they did. So there are 11 contemporary poets, three who wrote specifically for the book, and then all the other poets that are part of it from different time periods. And, and in a way, it's kind of appetizers. I, I, what I would like to do is for people to read a little bit and say, I need to know this poet better. And I also think poetry is not is underappreciated in general these days. And apparently it's much more lively here than in Europe. They, they have seminars, poets get together, they read to each other, they give medals, they have uh, competitions. Uh, I was amazed at how lively the poetry world is in India. So it was very interesting. 
You know, Kathleen, it's it's been fascinating talking to you. One thing that's uh, that's very evident in your paintings right from the beginning is this uh, very vivid color. It's the colors are always vivid. I mean, uh, where do you think you get that from? Did you start out that way, no. or is it some? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I d developed slowly. In my my earlier paintings, I concentrated mostly on drawing, but that once again. I don't like to be so hard on art schools, but I never had a color theory class. <laughs> so finally, my teacher, the famous teacher that I was with for enti his entire life, said, read these books on color. There are books uh, by Johannes Itten describing how color works. And that was a revelation. And then I understood much more about how to compose in color. And it has become... Um, an integral part of the way I compose paintings. In other words, the painting should be strong even if you don't yet know what it's about. The color combinations should already create an atmosphere and if you remove all of the narrative material, you should be able to say, wow, those colors are nice. So actually what I do is I work on them separately and then merge them to mm. make sure that when I concentrate on color, I'm really concentrating on color. Well. Wow. Mm. And the other, of course, uh, more or less permanent um, presence in your paintings has been women and children. Yes. Well, their universe is more accessible to me. And uh, I feel a kinship as a mother and a woman with both of those situations, with children and with uh, women. But um, they're just such a pleasure to paint. You know, children, children in general. I don't just paint little girls. I paint little boys too. They're, the innocence, the sweetness. It's a one type of beauty that's totally unaware of itself. Later on, as people grow older, women especially, they can be quite proud of their beauty. But little children are gorgeous without even knowing it, you know? And that is something I love to try to render in a painting, that innocent beauty that doesn't even know how beautiful it is. And uh, also the treatment is very, I mean, there seems to be a, it's not, the figures are sort of melting in and melting out of dimensions. There mm -hmm. seems to be an interdimensional kind of... Uh, yes, that, that developed early on, this transparency and the layering. Um, it's a way, it's a, I would say it's a narrative tool. So that in the same painting, I can put something close up, something far away. I can mix imagery to... Um, to create an entire atmosphere. And so it's something I enjoy doing, playing with images in general. And it allows me to create an entire universe around a character. Now, this is something that I've asked uh, uh, all the artists who've been here, and something uh, that I wonder how an artist handles, because art is, uh, as it is practiced today, it's a very individual process. And it's also, uh, like you mentioned, it, ego can get in the way very quickly mm -hmm. of art. Whereas uh, in perhaps ancient times, it was a more collaborative process where an mm -hmm. entire team kind of worked on it, often in anonymity. You know, mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. built something or you built a temple, built a church, sure, built whatever. Sure. And uh, do you think there is a danger of an artist be becoming self-absorbed completely? And uh, will, will, that, will that hamper their spiritual growth? I would say that's a danger with anything you do. Mm -hmm. If you're a computer analyst and you think you're better than everybody else and smarter than everybody else, it's a, it's a trap you can fall in. Um, almost anything people would get good at, their ego could really take over. Sure. So I don't think it's really just artists. Now, the thing with the artists is we're in a particular time, once again, where we seem to celebrate the artist more than the art. I don't know how many invitations I've received where instead of seeing a picture of the person's artwork, they show me the person. Well, I'm not really <laughs> interested, you know. <laughs> just show me the work. I believe a painting should defend itself. And by that, I mean, if I had it to do, I would organize an exhibit to, if you want to see what's good, organize an exhibit. Don't put anybody's name on anything. Then see how the critics and the public react. Then you might get some honesty because they won't be colored by what other people have said or what they think they should say because people are afraid to express themselves <clears throat> about art today because they think maybe they don't know enough. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> personally, I think the best art critics are children. They say exactly <laughs> what they see, and they often have very good vision of what they're looking at. You know. Well, that's an idea. It would be wonderful to get kids to review art. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it would be, it would be really wonderful. And if they ask a question, it's probably a logical question that you need to address. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea of a master was always there in art. You learnt with the master. You even in the Renaissance, you apprenticed with the master. Mm -hmm. um, in spirituality and meditation, is it pretty much the same? Is the role of the master pretty much the same, or is there any difference? Well, it's different in the sense that at some point you go off on your own. You need the master to show you the technique. You really need that. The, the, the technique I use is a combination of the Italian and Flemish Renaissance. I make my emulsion, my medium myself. I never would have been able to figure that out. You, know. you need the master to correct your drawing when you're still weak enough that you, you know there's something wrong, but you don't know what. People can get really discouraged when the painting isn't going right and they don't know why. And we've all been in that position. So there is a point when technically you've got it together and then you move on. I don't think there's ever that point with a meditation master. He's always one step ahead of you and can always give you something. You don't outgrow him. You can outgrow a, a, you know, someone who shows you a, a good technique and and at some point you should, because you should go off on your own and your own um, desire to express what you have to express. And like I said, the development of your audience will, to a great degree, determine how you treat subjects. And also about uh, growth, as you mentioned, you know, the, the uh, changes happen. There's n it's never the same uh, The art also changes. The artist changes with that. Do you find your art continuously changing? Yes, it has its almost its own logic, I would say. Mm -hmm. I often feel like I'm running after it rather than leading it anywhere. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to know where it wants to go. You know. And which direction is it pointing in now? Well, I'm working on a large painting of Indian women, uh, my worker princesses. Uh, I start putting in the faces. Uh, somehow something doesn't feel right. I change them, I change them, I change them, I change them. And then I say, oof, that feels better. It's kind of like you're cold, you're cold, you're warm, you're warm. Hey, you're getting warmer. You're getting, this is it. I got it. I got it. It's, it's kind of an organic functioning, you know. So it kind of happens. Now, it's true that almost any painting could go almost anywhere at almost any time. Mm -hmm. But um, it's like improvisation. A, a really good uh, musician does great music and improvises as he goes. He has the strength to overcome the technical. Uh, he doesn't have to think, you know, I have to do this, this. It was like a dancer. He doesn't think one step to the right, one step to the left. He's got that. Now he needs to interpret it. And it's true with interpretation. Every day would give you a slightly different interpretation. Sure, sure. And do you, um, do you also teach... Uh, uh, students, do you take I apprentices? Have this. In fact, I taught a number of Mexican painters. Oh, wow. Now, in Mexico, if a young man says to his family he wants to be a painter, they actually celebrate that. Wow. Yes, artists celebrated in Mexico. So I had a few students who became very, very good, and one of them who moved back to Mexico and has done very well. The thing with this technique is since it's a technique that dates from the Renaissance, the uh, time needed to do a painting that's, say, a meter wide, uh, a normal delay would be about six months. Wow. Well, we don't really, um, most painters now, if you tell them, I'll be happy to teach you this technique, but you are willing to spend six weeks full time on this small for format, <laughs> usually they say no. <laughs> usually they say no. But if you look at... Um, classical art from any civilization, you know, if you go to Elora, Janda, they took their time. Sure. I mean, sometimes time. lifetimes. I mean, mm -hmm. there are many generations yeah. who worked on the well, same. They're cathedrals, you know. You, you lived and died, and then somebody took over, and he continued. And yeah. The Sagridia Familias, I think that's the... the oh, they're still working They're on still it? working on it, mm -hmm. and, and the estimate is about 120 years now. Mm -hmm. they, they I should. remember the sign up that said... He who says it will never be finished doesn't know our people. <laughs> <laughs> but Gaudi was an inspired, inspired artist and architect. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly, certainly. 
So it's been just wonderful talking to you, Kathleen. Thank We've you. been speaking for an hour, but it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful sharing your thoughts you. and uh, in the future. Just one last question, which is on the top of everybody's mind right now. I mean, everybody discussing these two letters, AI has become extremely have you have you been following I've been watching that yeah <laughs> and it's it's fascinating it's fascinating honestly to me for the moment ai is it's a calculating thing so it it doesn't work like a human mind works but i think it gets us out of the box hmm. i remember seeing a short film on ai where th there's a robot it has four legs they break a leg off the robot and then they tell the robot fix yourself well, because the robot doesn't think like we do, it may think, well, the best way to get across the floor is just to roll, considering my current condition. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yes. We yes. would say, well, maybe he'll go get a crutch or he'll fix his leg. Hmm. Well, he might, you know, or he or she or whatever we want to call it, might have some totally unexpected way of going about fixing itself. So I think uh, it can be of real use to us to break our mental habits and our ideas about how things should be done. I think that once you remove all formatting, all kinds of things can sure. come to the fore. Sure. As far as it replacing human feelings and human expression, no. <laughs> no, I'm not. I feel totally unthreatened. Totally unthreatened. Now, what I have been seeing with the artists is they tend to use these... Um, generators of images but what is it doing it's using a bank of images that were done by artists so it's basically making a different kind of stew out of those pictures that could have you know make copyright issues but you know i have found my paintings in all kinds of places on the internet that they use for as long as they don't use it for a cause that i don't approve of i don't care yeah, Let the digital world is very difficult Let to police. Take it. You can't. No. <laughs> you want it? Take it. No. <laughs> I had a friend who it. wrote in a prompt to one of these AI painting programs. And I'm from the Himalayas. My friend is there from in the Himalayas. And he said, can you paint the Himalayas like Van Gogh was painting them? And they did it. And it was, you know, you had these Himalayan flowers in front of the snow peaks and everything. So it's just... Uh, Sometimes, but sometimes, I mean, I actually tried with one of them. I said, um, give me a portrait of myself in Leonardo da Vinci's style. Oh. It just looked weird. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't look anything like me. <laughs> and it looked very bizarre. <laughs> so, well, they need to work on that one a little more. <laughs> so I think art schools shouldn't feel threatened. Not at all. Not at all. You know, Drawing with a tool is something that's been done since cave painting days, and humans are particularly good at it. You know, and they've always been good at it. So, you know, this AI thing, okay, make whatever you want, but a real painting, all you would get if you do the AI is a reproduction of some sort. It might be fun for graphic stuff or posters, but a painting is a painting, and it was done by hand. It has a certain surface, it has a certain feel, it has a certain smell. Sure, sure. It has a totally different presence. That's why, uh, you know, y people, I have two kinds of people in my audience, those who can buy reproductions and those who don't want to even hear about a reproduction. <laughs> so an original yeah. is an original, it will remain so. Sure, sure. And are there any contemporary artists that you really admire, that you really uh, are inspired by? You know, Sometimes I don't know their names, but I do spend a lot of time looking at what people are doing on the Internet, and there's some very inspiring work. There are some beautiful things going on, and I'm always thrilled when they're successful. There's one a female Russian artist, Olga Suranova or something like that. She's really good, really good. And I'm thankful that we have the Internet so I can see those things. Otherwise, she'd be in Russia, and we wouldn't know about her, and... Sure, mm. sure. Yeah, there's internationally, I would say there's, I go on Pinterest and look at all, you know, I'll type in color uh, experts because I really am interested in color. And you come up with contemporary painters who are really good, really good. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen. It's been really wonderful. I thank you for taking too. this <laughs> time out. It was really fun. And all the best for all the endeavors and the giant and painting you that you're all. working on. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Ghanacast. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. 
To listen to more such conversations, do subscribe to Kanha Cast on YouTube, or you can also find us on Spotify on the Kanha Cast channel. That is K A N H A C A S T. Short excerpts from these conversations are also on Instagram. Once again, thank you for listening. This is Hill Dog signing off. Namaste and woof woof.